Hello and welcome to a worship video of St Andrews, Wallace Green and Lowick, Church of Scotland. As always, it's lovely to welcome you and uh, we do hope that you enjoy this worship video. In this video, we're going to be thinking about the important topic of the way in which our Christian faith changes our perspective on life, on our values, our choices and our priorities. Part of the way in which being a Christian or having faith in Christ changes us is that we are called upon to witness to that faith. And we're going to think about that theme in our next song, which is the song, I'm not ashamed to own my Lord. Let us pray. The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. Living God, in our desire for meaning and purpose in life, you remind us that you're available to us in our hour of need. As we reach out in our times of searching, you promise us that you will listen and answer beyond our imaginings. When we place our trust in our human enterprises, you call us back to your holy place to meet with you and to rest in your presence. Forgive us for putting our trust in the things of the world. When others look for success in their chariot and horses in times of battle, let us put our trust in your ways. When the world builds success and power and control, let us believe in your ways of building a kingdom of righteousness and love. When we fall short of all you expect of us, let us hold to your promise that you will pick us up again and set our feet on your path once more. So we turn from human enterprise to the kingdom of God, from human failure to the forgiveness of God, from human weakness to the strength of God and from human focus to the purpose of God our Lord. We praise your name and rejoice in the love and strength the purpose and the success, the triumphs and growth that come not from our hands, but from yours alone. And when our time of prayers is over, let us lift up our heads and look ahead with courage. When our time of devotion is complete, let us rise with confidence to service and commitment. For you are our answer in our time of need. You are our answer in the hour of our calling. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our first reading is from the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 15 verses 34 to chapter 16 verse 13. Then Samuel went to Ramah and King Saul went home to Gibeah. As long as Samuel lived, he never again saw the king, but he grieved over him. The Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king of Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you go on grieving over Saul? I have rejected him as king of Israel, but now get some olive oil and go to Bethlehem to a man named Jesse, because I have chosen one of his sons to be king. How can I do that? Samuel asked. If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord answered, take a calf with you and say that you are there to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will tell you what to do. You will anoint as king the man I tell you to. Samuel did what the Lord told him to do and went to Bethlehem where the city leaders came trembling to meet him and asked, Is this a peaceful visit, seer? Yes, he answered. I have come to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me. He also told Jesse and his sons to purify themselves, and he invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Jesse's son Eliab and said to himself, This man standing here in the Lord's presence is surely the one he has chosen. But the Lord said to him, Pay no attention to how tall and handsome he is. I have rejected him because I do not judge as people judge. They look at the outward appearance but I look at the heart. Then Jesse called his son Abinadab and brought him to Samuel. But Samuel said, No, the Lord hasn't chosen him either. Jesse then brought Shammah. No, the Lord hasn't chosen him either. Samuel said, In this way, Jesse brought seven of his sons to Samuel. And Samuel said to him, No, the Lord hasn't chosen any of these. Then he asked him, have you any more sons? Jesse answered, There is still the youngest, but he is out taking care of the sheep. Tell him to come here, Samuel said. We won't offer the sacrifice until he comes. So Jesse sent for him. He was a handsome, healthy young man and his eyes sparkled. The Lord said to Samuel, This is the one. Anoint him. Samuel took the olive oil and anointed David in front of his brothers. Immediately, the Spirit of the Lord took control of David and was with him from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 10 and verses 14 to 17. So we're always full of courage. We know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord's home. For our life is a matter of faith, not of sight. We are full of courage and would much prefer to leave our home in the body and be at home with the Lord. More than anything else, however, we want to please him, whether in our home here or there. For all of us must appear before Christ to be judged by him. We will each receive what we deserve according to everything we have done, good or bad, in our bodily life. We are ruled by the love of Christ now that we recognise that one man died for everyone, which means that all share in his death. He died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but only for him who died and was raised to life for their sake. No longer then do we judge anyone by human standards. Even if at one time we judged Christ according to human standards, we no longer do so. Anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone. The new has come. Thanks be to God.
1 Samuel 16 and verse 7 But the Lord said to Samuel, Pay no attention to how tall and handsome he is. I have rejected him, because I don't judge as human beings judge. Human beings look at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. What do we value in the world? How do we decide what's right and wrong? How do we decide what our priorities will be? These are the questions which are raised by the story of the anointing of David to be king. The background to the story is that Saul is judged by, by Samuel as having failed as king. Samuel has ordered Saul on behalf of God to totally destroy everything living amongst the people called the Amalekites. But Saul doesn't carry out Samuel's instructions. Sure enough, he destroys all the people apart from the king, but he keeps the best of the sheep and the cattle as booty for him and his men. We might well think that that was a good choice on Saul's part, but Samuel sees it otherwise. Saul, he says, has disobeyed God. And so he has proved himself to be unfit to be king, for God is interested first and foremost in obedience, not sacrifice, nor independent thinking. And so this brings us to the anointing of David and this wonderful story of how God directs Samuel to look past the obvious choices and to select David to be the new king. The point of the story seems to be that David is the least obvious choice because he's the youngest and least experienced of the brothers. He's good looking and a sparky individual, but still he's the youngest. There seems to be a thread in scripture of God choosing the younger or weaker over the more experienced or the stronger. Joseph is chosen amongst his brothers. Gideon is chosen, though he is hardly an experienced or mighty warrior. Moses is chosen, even though he's not a very good speaker. And Jeremiah is chosen despite his youth. As Paul says, God often seems to delight in choosing the weak things of the world in order to shame the wise and the strong, no doubt some encouragement for us. And so it is with David. God's ways of valuing and judging go far beyond surface appearances. And so it must be with us. As we make our choices, decide what our priorities will be, we are called to see things from a God's eye point of view, to see beyond the outward appearance. And it's the Apostle Paul who explains what this means for the Christian. He says, first of all, it means that in all our thinking, choosing and decisions, our priority must be to please God. For those who want to follow Christ, our first commitment is not to pleasing ourselves, doing what we want or what we like. It's not even to pleasing our loved ones. Nor is it service of country or the best deployment of the talents that we've discovered. No, our overriding commitment is to pleasing God, which may of course include the other things but sometimes not. The second thing that Paul explains is why we desire to please God. It is because we recognise in the cross a symbol of the depth of God's love for all people. When we glimpse the meaning of the cross, when we see the extent, the breadth and depth of God's love for all people, 
then we become those who are ruled, who are overwhelmed by a sense of God's love. And so impelled to respond to God's love with love for the Saviour. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. With the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life my all. And then thirdly Paul tells us that this new way of being that Christians have discovered has very practical consequences. The principle of Christ's love for us and our love for Christ becomes the guide for how we live our lives. The difference is so profound that Paul talks of it in terms of the old being replaced by something wholly, totally new. It's as if a whole new way of looking at things has become ours. At one time it was as if we saw things in black and white. Now it's as if we see things in the spectrum of colour that is given to life by knowing God's love. Samuel chose an unlikely candidate to be king. God chooses us, unpromising as we are, to be King Jesus' representatives in the world. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. serve the purpose of God in my generation. I want to serve the purpose of God while I am alive. I want to give my life for something that will last forever. Oh, I delight, I delight to do your will. What is on your heart? Tell me what to do Let me know your will And I will follow you What is on your heart? Tell me what to do Let me know your will And I will follow you I want to build silver and gold in my generation. I want to build silver and gold while I am alive. I want to give my life for something that will last forever. Oh, I delight, I delight to do your will. What is on your heart? Tell me what to do Let me know your will And I will follow you What is on your heart Tell me what to do Let me know your will And I will follow you I want to see the Lord come again in my generation. I want to see the Lord come again while I am alive. I want to give my life for something that will last forever. Oh, I delight, I delight to do your will. So what is on your heart? Tell me what to do. Let 
let me know your will and I will follow you. What is on your heart? Tell me what to do. Oh, let me know your will and I will follow you. As the Spirit came on that first Pentecost in wind and fire, so may we notice the Spirit at work in our own lives. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with each one of us this day and evermore. Amen. My soul be Lord unto the Lord, my spirit shall be the same, and all the secrets of mine heart praise ye his holy name. Give thanks to God for all his gifts, show no thy cell and kind, and suffer no his benefits, taste let boot o thy mind. That gave thee pardon for thy faults, and